not sure this is okay thanks all right i forgot to start recording this at the beginning of the call um yeah if you want to oh amen yeah i have uh, also one question regarding the spec that i would like to ask is that i think what we should do with the data section is not clear uh, in the EIPs. And uh, that should be uh, also included in the spec. So it is clear what you should do with the data section. What do you mean do with the data section? So uh, as, from my understanding, the data section is sometimes used to call the constructor of the newly created contract as a parameter to call the constructor of the newly created contract, or is my understanding incorrect? Uh, I, I think it's still an open question of what, uh, how the constructor arguments will be passed into the init code. A complaint that the Solidity team was having was that if they are going to generate the constructor arguments in the, you know, the contract that deploys, that just, um, submits the contract deployment, then they would need to recalculate the data section size of the container in EVM code before the create is called. And so for that reason, they preferred that there was just extra data at the end of the contract for the init code. So as far as we know right now, you're saying data section is useless. It's just to submit data to the blockchain, not used in the AVM, I mean, in any case. No, it can be used with uh, code data load and you can manipulate it within your EVM code. Right. I think the original inspiration for the data section was that people were creating contracts that they were using as data. And we wanted to give developers that functionality natively in a way where that data couldn't potentially be executed. Sorry, just a question. Um, code, did you say code data load, Dano? Maybe I got the uh, the opcode name wrong, but there's one where you load it from your current uh, bytecode. Code code copy code copy so but code copy uh, does that so does that operate on the whole container or what what does that operate on? it does it operates okay. on the entire container i think all of the ops in that family that operate on code overall right now are you know continue to operate on the container level rather than wouldn't, localized per section wouldn't that be more useful to have opcodes that operate on the data section only? But then we would have to add new opcodes uh, for that. Yeah, I think that's probably what's going to happen at some point, but... Vitalik yeah, wanted that. Vitalik wanted the, the code copies only to work on data sections to create a potential future where we retranslate the code in the code section, but... I think that got brought up too late to be integrated into this current round of spec. Got it, thank you. Can I add something to this? Please. So I think, <clears throat> yeah, I'm kind of going around this. Like, I think this is the core issue is that how create works. So create doesn't like when you're creating a contract, you don't have like call data as in like regular execution. It's always empty. Uh, and like the the constructor, the 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 contract gets um is taken from from just yeah uh adding the data to the to the actual code. So it, it lands. The constructor arguments actually lands in data section in in EOF case, and um, yeah, <laughs> I think it would be simple if that's kind of separated and there's like separate stream of data for for the the call data in the create instruction, but it's not the current situation. And uh, 
And because of that, like traditionally, you just append this data to the like init code and and then the code running inside the init code just knows where the data is and so on. But like the, the kind of ugly, ugly aspect of that is that now the contract that creates another contract needs to kind of reprocess the OF and usually patch the, the data size, the data section size in the OF container. So it means that it needs to manipulate the AIF format somehow. I think it's not super difficult, but there are cases with this is like super, almost impractical, I think, to my understanding, especially when you consider the cases that sometimes Solidity, uh, sometimes contracts wants to like pre-compute the return address of some like future creation and then like it's getting complicated <laughs> so like like kind of ugly fix as well and that's my kind of <laughs> um uh yeah scoring of this of this approach is to like allow external data or something like that in this init code situation that we kind of discussed a bit i'm not sure this is great but uh maybe it's not worth the trouble and like have this limited availability of of doing this like previous previous like use cases um what else and like kind of i see it like if we kind of redesign the create a bit maybe that's like we can find like better solution but that's definitely not something we can hope to include right now So what do you think the right next steps are for resolving this? Because it seems like there's two main paths for dealing with the constructor arguments. And one is like, as you described, manipulating the data size and adding the constructor in the data section. And then the other, it's, I guess there's three. Then the other one is appending the constructor to the init code. And then the last one is changing how create works. And the last one's sort of out because it's too large of a change. And so the question is, how do we decide if we want to allow this extra data after, uh, you know, just for the init code purpose? Um, so to my understanding, Solidity can handle this, uh, this thing right now. It just like this additional code that will do the patching and so on. And that works like in most of the cases. The things that probably don't work is to pre-computing, uh, create two addresses with some like not, not static size arguments. So for example, if the constructor of the create two takes an array, it's really complicated or maybe it's it's impractical to like pre-compute it, but I, I, I might be wrong about some details. So I think <clears throat> I would just keep it as it is if we don't plan to, to include new changes or there's no time for it, uh, which I think that's the current status. And we might lose some use cases. Uh, so, but I think that's a bit better than trying to kind of quickly patch it. Okay, Dana. Um. I'm afraid those use cases are going to be pretty big and it's going to be a pretty big uh, limitation to require all of your init code to fit inside the container and we need to find the size of the container dynamically. This is, I think this is an important thing we need to get fixed before we ship it. Um, we need to, I think we, my opinion is we should do what we need to do to get it fixed. Um, whether we allow create a init code to not have a size limitation or we change the size limitation to be container must be at least the same or larger than the data section would apply or, or, or something. We need to do something. Create would be another way to do it, but that is that that even would even go beyond Cancun. I don't think I have the time to define that well and get people on board with it. That's like a one, two year out solution there. But I don't think that I, I think we need to get it fixed so that we can have arbitrary array data for a constructor. Oh. Um, 
Yeah, I think um, uh, I I don't like have like full full view about it. Um, in solidity, we should be like better um, team to comment on this. I think the constructor works. What doesn't work if you want to pre-compute the address inside some other contract, right? Uh, but okay, I think the I think I agree. This like this like some issues with it, and we might not even know like what exactly kind of issues we will have with that. And uh, one more thing, um, which is kind of related is also the fact that we now expect um, the return of the of the init code execution to be also EOF format, right? Which means <clears throat> the, the like returning empty empty code, it's not it's not valid in this case. And I think someone commented that there is kind of a use case when you actually have an init code that inside the init code creates another contract. And in the end, it just like returns nothing. And then this, this contract, like the main one will not be created because empty code means empty account. And this account kind of successfully was created, but also will not be like, reflected in the state. And that's this use case that we also kind of break because you need to return empty OF, which is, this has some bytes and these bytes will be deployed, although they will be pretty useless. I think I've seen that used before where people just want to execute a string of EVM code and not leave a contract around from the transaction. So I think it's, I don't know if we need to support it through EOF, but if we're going to make features that are EOF only, then we might need to start considering how to handle an empty uh, create from that. If we require EOF or an empty code, I think might be a one solution there. I guess this is something that we can later allow empty code to be deployed. This is backwards compatible with the changes that we have. So I don't think it's something that we need to come to consensus on right now. I, I think there's enough of a consensus. There's, it's always good to have a null value in any system like this. So you're saying that you feel we need to allow empty contracts to be deployed from EOF? Yeah, it's something that people already do. It's perfectly logical. Um, it's just the null value for that algebra. Because it deploys with notes zero, right? So if there's right. no money, no storage, no notes, it right. will be a wash. Yeah, but no, no um, it does doesn't though. So. So it deploys with a with a nonce one, doesn't it? No, nonce one. So it does yeah. leave garbage around. Okay. Yeah. So it's totally. It's, I mean, it's a totally useless thing to deploy a contract with a nonce one, leaving it forever unable to, you know, handle any any inputs or. Mm -hmm. or yeah. Uh, I thought so the idea that's an unwanted side effect. But I thought the idea was, you leave. <laughs> less behind in just running that EVM code than if you're you know forced to 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 have a bit of actual contract code there. Uh, yeah, I mean less yes, but you still have an imprint on state, right? Yeah. Because just reducing think, well I think the imprint on state of having code zero versus an quote unquote empty EOF container is negligible because we're only going to store one version of the code hash. So as long as most people are deploying empty EOF containers after they run their code, then it's you know not really going to be any overhead. Right. So with notes one, you're going to leave something in the account tree. Right, but that would happen already if we allowed uh, people to deploy you have contracts with size zero.
So that behavior doesn't go away. It's just that we're not going to be storing a whole bunch of, you know, 10, 20 byte EOF containers that do nothing. We're just gonna store it once and then we'll have the code hash for them. So I think it's out of scope of EOF, but I think we should consider a change that zero code doesn't create an account, but that's out of scope yes. of this discussion. Um, I agree with both of those. Uh, yeah. I yeah. think I might have like presented it wrongly uh, because I think the original use case was using self-destruct in the end. Uh, but I saw a comment that like returning empty is like equivalent, but I think, yeah, we, I missed the nonce, the nonce thing. So mostly the, the use case was that there's init code that creates other contracts or do other stuff. And in the end of that, it self detracts. So then the contract is not created. I see. But the effects that the were applied on the way uh, will still hold. Yeah. I think we should continue debating this question of if we should allow zero code contracts to be deployed offline. Uh, I do want to try and resolve this question about what to do with constructor values for the init code. It doesn't seem like there's very good consensus. I'm like currently leaning towards making no change unless we could present like a really clear example that's going to make things much harder if we have to put the constructor in the data section. We can always do a change in the future to allow extra data after the init code container like we were discussing but we can't easily in the future say that's no longer allowed. So unless there is a good example right now of like this is going to not be possible by putting the constructor in the data section, I think that we should leave it as is and then decide again in the future. Does anybody oppose that? Okay. Uh, I will document that. Oh, Ahmed. Yeah, just about the uh, data copy uh, of code. Uh, does anyone feel strongly against adding it into 3540? Mm. So, um, what exactly are you proposing? Are you proposing adding a new opcode, so another opcode? Yeah, just an opcode to copy the data section to make it easier to manipulate. It the exists. OX35, call data load. What do you mean, call, call data load? That's no, he wants, he wants an opcode like code copy, but that operates only on the data section. Got it. Uh, I, I in theory, I'm not, I'm not opposed to the idea per se, but yes, I, I would be opposed to doing like to just throw in new, new, uh, instructions at this point. Um, because I think we should try to just get EOF finalized. The, yeah, uh, that's the kind of how I feel right now. The problem of not adding, add, adding it right now is that in the case that we want to add it later, it will be a totally different EOF version. No, it won't be a new EOF version. We can apply yeah, can have upgrades. Code. Yep. It doesn't <clears throat> change any previous behavior, so we can just add it in, in a fork. Mm, true, true. The set of invalid code reduces, but we don't take stuff that was in the valid set and move it to the invalid set. So it's a compatible change if we just add an off code. Exactly. Yep. The only cost is that people who are deploying contracts in that time period between will have to pay to calculate what offset they're going to load, start loading data from. And I think that's okay. Would that be paired with deprecating call data load inside copying the code sections as well to go with the code vision? Copy? Yeah, code copy. Well, not call, yeah, code code copy. Yeah, sorry, 39. I'm looking it's too early for me. Um, would that be paired with with 
deprecated code copy inside of EOF, so it can't copy code code, but only data section? I think it could be. That's something that's going to be a larger debate, I think, though. So. Right. Maybe we should put a warning, like going out with self-destruct, that this may not work in the future when we roll it out on day one, so we don't get surprised saying, oh, I depend on this. Well, the problem is, is that if we're going to have people using the data section to put the constructor, their constructors in, then I think it's going to be difficult to fully deprecate code copy in EOF, in which case we would need to probably do another EOF yeah. section or new another EOF. If version. they're if they're making a quine and copy the code that exists, um, we could we could make a scarier sounding warning and scale it back if we need. But I think if we're going to do Vitalik's vision, we might might need to uh, put something in there. Yeah. Probably. Yeah, like I think like yeah, code copy is heavily used. Like one is this like constructor arguments, and secondly, the the immutable uh, immutable variables in Solidity are used this way. So like there's every contract, you, you should assume like every contract uses this anyway. So, right, like, but if, warning, is it referencing? Go ahead. Yeah. So warning will like not help at all. So uh, yeah, I'm like my I I don't know my view is like I would like to spend a bit more time on it, like thinking about how the contracts are created and limit the like observability of the of the code, which we, I think the current current situations kind of go a bit into the other direction. So like the fact that Solidity like the EVM code needs to understand EOF format, I think that's uh, that's a bit like, yeah, the opposite of what I would like to see somewhere. But uh, this is like, this is the different set of features. So maybe for future, maybe never, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, if, if we're going for Shanghai, definitely we can't touch it at all. <clears throat> but they could put their constants and everything in the data section. And we were just warned that code copy may not copy code from a code section or the EOF header in the future. Yeah, I guess that, that could be possible. Yeah, yeah, I guess um, so. But like we'll like we'll end up with like this weird instruction then <laughs> that kind of only like allows you to access the data, but the offsets are something else. But you still need to know what the offsets are, right? So like <laughs> Even though it only allows you to copy data, it assumes like the like the the structure of the of the container doesn't change at all because you need to exactly know where the data section is. Right, that's usually the last linking step of a compiler. Once it lays everything out, it can rewrite the numbers. Up. Yeah, yeah, but that's that's like the, that leaks some information about the code you're having, right? So. I guess ideally, like True. VM cannot like snip anything out of that, uh, except data, which which for for the the other word is just like stream of bytes, and we never assume we'll actually modify data because why would you? But the rest, at least you would, yeah. I guess that's like this this Vitalik idea that you can't expect it. So yeah, you can modify it somehow, upgrade it externally to something else and i think that's really interesting but we don't have a proper design for it as of now i feel like we should put this conversation on pause for now i think we're going to talk about these ideas of the talks proposal a lot on thursday and maybe in the coming days and i do want to talk about testing and test nets and stuff so if there aren't any other other uh, spec related questions or comments, then we should move on to testing. Okay. Uh, I know that the Epsilon team has been putting a lot of work in and writing some cross client tests in Ethereum slash test. Does someone from the team want to give an update on what's going on there? Yeah, we have several PRs open. Uh, the one the most ready is 3540 
tests. Uh, I think, yeah, client teams can already try it. Others are not so ready, I would say. Yeah, I run the fillers or the field tests for 3540 on my branch of guests and I passed them except for about 14 of them and half of those were ones against Berlin. So I'll look into it. So it should be possible for other clients to to run those tests. Uh, do we have any idea when we might be able to release those? Well, these 3540 tests just need the review from the testing team, I guess. Okay. Others, I'm not sure, still in progress. The others being uh, like individual focus tests for each uh, of the other EIPs. Yes, currently there is a PR for 3670, for 4200, and 4752. Yeah. Okay. Um. By I the way, one, that... one thing to note about this 3540 mm -hmm. test, uh, 3860 limit on, uh, in, uh, meter unit code is not activated in that. Uh, and yeah, we will regenerate these tests as soon as GAF uh, merges 3860. So for now, it's without 3860. Okay. Thanks for that update. Um... Other tests, Mario has written quite a few ELF tests, maybe three weeks, one month ago. And over the past week, I was trying to get them updated to the latest spec changes and things. Now they are fillable. So I've been able to fill them with the, the guest branch. And um, yeah, we're going to try and get that merged pretty soon. I don't know, Mario, if you have, want to comment at all on plans for those yeah. tests. Yeah, not yet. I'm I'm still going to take a look over the changes. And yeah, I think I will prioritize that to finish today, have a have a review ready for you. Great. So I think with respect to testing overall, we really need to at least get some test suite published and release so that all of the clients can run them. And we at least sort of have like a baseline of what everyone is targeting and implemented, et cetera, so that we can try and do a test net in the next you know, couple of days. I think we should really have something, some sort of test net before all core devs, because that was part of the stipulation that January 5th, all the clients have implemented ELF. And obviously, you know, we're still going to be working on testing and differential fuzzing and improving all of these things over the next couple of weeks. But as a like a good faith effort, I think it would be great to get a test suite released and start a test net. Does that seem like something that is doable to clients? Uh, wait before this all core devs or uh, before the next one? Uh, before this all core devs. So the problem with the testnet could be that if we didn't run any tests, we will end up with some consensus issues uh, and so we will spend lots of time on debugging the issues uh, instead of just running tests yeah i agree that's why i'm saying that i think we need to initially have a test seat suite released so that we are all on the same page at least do client i mean would clients prefer to like focus on doing a test net wednesday of next week or something rather than trying to do it before all core does this week and just focus on like solidifying the cross client tests. Um, before all core devs might be hard because if we notice that something is failing 
on this test, we will have no time to uh, fix issues. But uh, next week sounds better, in my opinion. I think we're going to spend most of our time the next few days doing the the fuzz testing rather than the, the test net. I think we'll get more signal out of that than a, yeah. than a dev net. Yeah, that that seems fine. I I don't know, Tim, if you have any thoughts on this, but I think if we if we do come with a test suite before all core devs and we have like a pretty good idea of clients, you know, are passing ninety x percent of this test suite, then. Yeah, I think I, I would agree that's the most probably valuable signal. Um, and then also the testnet bits, there might be like, it, it might be worth discussing, do we want to have just one broader testnet for client teams to join versus like an EOF only one? And, and I feel like yeah, if we have that conversation on all core devs, it, it'll inform what, what we do here. Uh, okay, that sounds good. Let's Let's focus on that. Let's focus on getting a test suite before all core devs so we can get an idea of like where clients teams are. And then, you know, ourselves right now, we can say we're sort of planning on doing a test net next week, but that's going to depend, be pending on the conversation that happens on Thursday at all core devs. Andrew? Uh, yeah, so uh, I'd like to double check that EOF is based on Shanghai core, right? So we are not like doing some weird Thing where we don't have some bits of Shanghai core, but we have some bits of EOF, things like that. Because in, in for instance, in Geth, I know that, um, like uh, there is one particular point. I know that um, IPA 3860 is not merged into Geth yet. And there has been recently in cha a change to IPA 3860. So I would like to, like to finalize the change to IP 3860, uh, finalize IP 3860 merge, IP 3860, and like enable all like all Shanghai core IPs in in Shanghai, and like so to avoid situations where yeah some bits of EOF are enabled, some bits of Shanghai core are not enabled, and so on. Yep, I am agreement in agreement with that. Amen. Yeah, is the 3860 finalized, the PR? I think it's not merged yet. Is there any strong proponents to merging it? Merging it into Geth or merging the change into the EAP? Into EAP. I think everybody is on board with making that OOG. So. Uh, yeah, I think we can just assume that that change is going to be made. Okay, so the test suite that is currently the PR that Epsilon team right now had prepared does not include that change as far as I know, as far as you guys know. Yeah, the EOF tests don't have 3860 is what Andre said. Uh, Paul? Um, so you think it's fine I merge the change? We just like present on all core devs that the change has been made or we should wait for like for the call on Thursday? Yeah, um, I feel like we can go ahead and make the changes in clients and talk about it on all core devs. And if for some reason something comes up where people have a problem with changing it, we can revert. But I think optimistically accepting it as changed is probably fine. Okay. I mean, I mean, I mean the spec change mostly. Oh, I see. Yeah, I think that's fine. I think that, yeah, in terms of client teams, we can just optimistically accept the change and we'll merge it officially after all core devs. Okay, thanks. Uh Hey, uh, I just have a question for the Epsilon team. Um, do you guys are getting a review on the tests PR from Dimitri or is there anything that you need from me that I can help with?
I mean, I think he reviews it, uh, but you can also take a look, of course, if you want. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I, I can take a look. I it's, it's just that we have two suites right now for for tests. Um, so I think ideally I can take a look at uh, the tests on the on the Python tests for review, and then that, if Dimitri can take a look on the tests. But I will I will also take a look if I have some time uh, today left. Okay. Great. Uh, I also put on the agenda just to mention this EOF parse tool. I think unfortunately Martin has had to go, but Martin has been doing some fuzzing with the EOF parse tool, found a handful of errors. I think Dan, you've also been doing some differential fuzzing. I don't know if you want to make a comment on how that's been going. So, I think it's been going well, but I think it exposes that we might want to add a new type of test to the reference tests. We have the um, general state test, the blockchain test, and the transaction test. And the transaction test, their goal is to say, is this transaction valid or not? I think we need a similar thing to the transaction test for EOF contracts, because the only question we have for you know a very large corpus is, is this accepted or not? And the alternative is to make a very large corpus of blockchain tests or a general state test, which are very heavy to calculate when the only question we want is, are they getting the stack validation correct? So I'm wondering if we should use our findings from this emerging to create a new, you know, transaction test type set that is just for the EOF. I could put together a proposal and put a patch and push it if needed to show what I'm thinking here, but I'm thinking that's the signal we're getting from EOF parse is very strong and very valuable just in the validation and we could focus the general state tests on the operators, not on the container format. Yeah, I think that makes sense to me. It seems to fit pretty nicely in line with the new transaction test that Martin had worked on sometime last year. And this does seem like it, something that would be a pretty good fit. I don't think this is something that we're going to make happen for Shanghai. I think, it, yeah, it's something that we should aspire to after Shanghai. I don't know if you think differently on that. It's assembling the test and getting all the clients to use the test is, is the Shanghai part. But I think we could get a corpus together relatively, you know, shortly within before we head off to Austria, I think, and we could grow it as we find bugs. So. I think, yeah, I can I can get a proposal out by the end of the week. Yeah, if you want to make a proposal, I think that we can definitely get something going. I don't know how like the integration will be with like, some of the official test repos, but we can definitely do something ad hoc by Austria and then talk about it there and decide how to, you know, merge it officially into like the testing suites that we have. So one question about that is that what do you have in mind? Do you mind? Do you mean that just verifying the container uh, in exactly. these tests, or also execution? No execution, just the container. No execution. We look at the container. We would run code validation. We run stack validation, and the question is: Is it valid or is it invalid? Is the real only output? And we might need to put it against different forks if we change this. We might need to put it against different use cases. Like, is it an init code? We'll want a comment saying why we expect this one to fail or what's interesting about it. Right, and this follows very closely to like how the transaction, the T9 in tool works. Basically you give it the transaction bytecode and it outputs like, was that transaction valid or not? So I think that that makes sense. Yep, uh, that's, that's my model. Yeah, just a comment. So we want to check in the transaction tests. That's the EOF containers valid, right? Yeah, transaction test, but instead targeting EOF containers, not transactions. Uh, okay, but uh, like if an EOF container is invalid, then the transaction itself is still valid. That's no, it's not a transaction. The input is going to be the raw EOF data, not a transaction creating an EOF. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, sure. 
it's just a simplified hook into that logic of doing the container validation. Okay, seven minutes left of the call. We're kind of coming to the end of the agenda. Were there any last comments on testing that people wanted to make? I think this this kind of testing, like this EOF validation can be really simple. Even you can have like, like one valid directory, one invalid directory and just place the, the bytecodes there respectfully. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, that's pretty much everything that was on the agenda. Are there any other questions or comments that people wanted to discuss regarding EOF? Um, uh, yeah, and I think it's expected, uh, on the all core devs from our side, like in general, like the, the group that's this involved in EOF, like, should there be like any report or like, um, I think that we just need to get this, get a testing suite released and figure out what the client test pass rate is for each of them. So we can basically come on and say, you know, this is how clients are doing with EOF testing. So people will sort of get an idea of what the status of that is. And I'm guessing like the other main thing that people want to talk about is they'll want to talk about Vitalik's proposal. So it might be good to revisit it a bit and think a little bit about the impacts. Great. Uh, do we want to schedule a, a sixth EOF breakout room or should we wait until after all core dubs? I kind make of feel like we can just resume. Okay. Make, make the call after all core dubs. Sounds good to me. That's it uh, for me. If anyone has last final comments, if not, I think we can just go ahead and call it right here. Cool. Thanks a lot, everybody. Happy New Year. Uh, let's just keep chatting in the EVM channel about the testing things that we find and yeah let's get a test suite released in the next couple of days thank you thank you yeah. thanks guys thank you. Happy, happy, happy new year. Year. cheers thanks bye